Thank you all for for, for joining. Um, I won't take too much of time, but I appreciate how valuable your time and thanks for coming out. Is I was very fortunate to I was uh, I was a teenager, and uh, it was my birthday. I just finished school, and my dad said to me, "What do you want?" My parents said to me, "What do you want as a present?" Uh, you want to have a party? I think it was 18 or something. And I said, no, no, no. I said, you know what I want for my birthday present? Send me to China. I don't know why, but I've always had this yearning to go as a, as a teenager. I just finished school. And so my, my parents wrote the check and packed me, put the ticket and packed me off to China. I ended up in, uh, in, uh, in Shenzhen, uh, more than that shortly, in Guangzhou in Hong Kong, uh, traveled through Guangdong province, southeast China, uh, Taiwan as well. And that started for me a very long journey of, uh, of uh, a couple of decades of spending a lot of time in China. I lived in, in, in all parts of Asia, uh, including in South Korea for two and a half years. I spent a lot of time in Singapore, lived on PhD Park in Taiwan, these places. And it's incredible to spend one's formative years in countries that were literally taking off. Countries that were growing at 7, 8, 9, 10% every single year. So when I look at our situation in Africa, um, and also just backtrack a second, living through crisis, the Asian financial crisis, 1969, I was living in Seoul at the time. And to see an economy um, implode overnight, was quite a, was the most accelerated learning period I ever had. Quite different from the structural decline in South Africa's case, but this was a shock. And I came away and I come now living in Johannesburg and I look back at this and say, you know, South Africans and, and, and we in Africa most often don't understand what is possible and what compound annual growth does to a, to a, to a society <coughs> at every level over an extended period of time in terms of impact, improving people's livelihoods, dramatic increase in personal wealth, creating embedded middle class societies, and ultimately developed countries. And that, I'm afraid, is something which, which most of us in this part of the world are unable to conceptualize and see actually what is possible when, Leon, as we often speak, is, is when the ingredients are right. So this is Deng Xiaoping. Uh, Deng Xiaoping uh, was, uh, took the helm in China. He, had a, his, um, he was imprisoned in the mid-60s, um, during the, the Cultural Revolution days. He was, um, his political career became, uh, once again, to the fore, and he assumed power in China, de facto power in China, the same that he said here. Deng Xiaoping was one of the great pragmatists, and he's very, very famous for many quotes. So many quotes, people can make quotes in this part of the world, and it doesn't, you know, no one meant it the next day. But in Asia, the symbolism, in China, the symbolism and the importance attached and the interpretation, the very intrinsic, or very almost forensic interpretation of, of key phrases about politicians are very, very important. And just after Deng Xiaoping went on his so-called uh, Nanshun, his southern tour to China and took down to Guangdong province to endorse reforms in 1992, that's when I was in Shenzhen. Shenzhen at the time, sorry, there's one person again, this thing doesn't seem to work, so I'm just, just to parrot down one. So this is Shenzhen in uh, sort of late 70s. Uh, this was a little border town. Those of you who've been to Hong Kong and gone to China, you would, have, you would have passed through Shenzhen. Shenzhen was a small little fishing village, literally, on the border of Hong Kong. All the locals used to look across the border, i.e. the perimeter fence of Hong Kong, see this neon light in Hong Kong and say, what, I wonder what's going on over there. Literally, that was what it was, effectively. And it was a, you know, a not really happening sort of place um, in the late 70s, very early 80s. Something incredible happened. Deng Xiaoping, the, the growth model of China is very simply stated, and I say that it's, it's the, the, the state has taken its foot off the throat of the private sector. That is what has driven and underpinned growth in China. We'll talk about state enterprises shortly and how the two sort of coexist. <laughs> but Shenzhen from, uh, sorry, one more time if you don't mind. This is Shenzhen today. <laughs> it's unrecognizable. So imagine a place like, um, let me give you a simple analogy. I don't know. 
Mechalisberg. The Amps are said to that Mechalisberg in three, three decades or so time will look like this. How many believe, how many believe, how many believe, how many believe that possibly? You'd probably say, are you insane? So this is what the Shinjin story has been. Now that's quite an incredible sort of figure, and you think, well, surely Martin's made a mistake. <coughs> but no, I have It's called the compound annual growth effect. And just to set um, a pretty context, a magic number for a country, uh, whether you're a company, whether you're an individual, your salary, whether a company, whether your country GDP, same principle of life. The magic number is seven. Because if you have a salary increase of 7% per year, or a company revenue increase of 7% per year, or even a country GDP of 7% per year, you double your salary, your revenue, or GDP every decade, every 10 years. Compound growth. So imagine China. China has been growing, did grow, at least until sort of recent years, at an average of 9.9% over a 25 year period. That's deeply impressive. Um, people talk in South Africa's case, and I still hear it among certain individuals say South Africa has a 7% growth target. Well, don't shoot the messenger, but no, it ain't going to happen. The last time South Africa grew at 7%, this is a very notable year, being 2017, because it's exactly, I checked the figures, I'm at. The highest growth year ever was 1964. For whatever reason. I wasn't around, I don't know. But that was the 7% sort of thing we just uh, sort of breached in, in, in 1967. So imagine a country that's grown beyond that for a generation. That's what China's done, enabled, as Leon mentioned, by these uh, SEZs. Just a couple more slides if you make. So this is Shenzhen. Those in the back, sorry for the small font, but Shenzhen's real GDP per capita in 2005 dollar terms. So in 1980, Shenzhen's GDP per capita was practically identical as your stereotypical unnamed sub-Saharan African economy. Today, Shenzhen is approaching the level of almost the same as South Korea, not too far off. Those who've been to Seoul know it's, it's a significantly wealthier country. And these figures probably are understated because I've never met Shin, anyone from Shenzhen who has one single job and one discernible source of income. Read into that as you go. The Shenzhen real GDP, you can see the dramatic increase as reforms took hold and Deng Xiaoping. And Shenzhen population has gone from, as I said, minuscule 300,000 odd there and now uh, approaching sort of rapidly, you know, according to this figure, 16 of million people, 15, 16 million people are changing today. Literally a stone throw away from Hong Kong. Uh, this is incredible. This is almost unprecedented. A compound annual growth rate of approaching 30% each year for every year for 30 years. <coughs> One small side point is if anyone tells me about, and this is, you know, if anyone tells me about a uh, country or an economy lacking skills, I'll point to a bad immigration policy. Because Shenzhen and the surrounding area is in Guangdong province. In Guangdong, no one speaks Mandarin Chinese, which is a sort of you know, lingua franca of China. Everyone speaks Cantonese, except in Shenzhen, because everyone's a migrant. Everyone speaks Mandarin in Shenzhen. Everyone is from somewhere else in China. Everyone having come to Shenzhen is an economic migrant pursuing the, how can I say, um, following the light of the free market that Shenzhen was from the mid 80s onwards. One last picture, two last pictures of May. 1993, this is Shanghai. One of the, Sherry, my colleague, is from Shanghai, one of the world's greatest cities. If you haven't been to Shanghai, I strongly suggest you go. Um, students. That's the Pudong district, that's the Huangpu River. So Pudong means east of the river uh, Huang or Huangpu. This is the west side, Pushi side, the old side, this is the old Bund. Okay, that's the old Peace Hotel. Now the Fairmont Peace Hotel. Um, the Peninsula Hotel has just been built around the corner. 
Empire. And those buildings were all built by the European semi-colonialists back in the day of the 19th century. Now, if you fast forward to Shanghai today, that's Shanghai. <laughs> Siva River, uh, Siva Flatland. I arrived in Shanghai literally around this time. And there was an amusement park over here. And I thought, what a waste of space. And it's a stupid amusement park with some swings and roundabouts. And I was like, this doesn't make any sense. And that was just my simple thought. But clearly the Chinese policy makers were thinking the same thing. And they built this instead. <laughs> so that now is the second tallest building in the world, for what it's worth. Uh, that's the sort of that was the uh, WFC tower, the I call the bottle opener, and that's the 88 story Jin Ma Tower. Uh, this was the first tall structure built on Pudong side. Uh, the new park high, if you ever if you guys save up, I know Rand is tough these days, but great to stay in the Park Hyatt Hotel which is the last 44 stories, stories of this building over here. But anyway, point being is, guys, this is, this is what capital and free market economics in China did. This is not the state investing in building, just building as they do. This is the incredible unleashing of market forces in the Chinese economy. After the mid-1980s, there were initially four special economic zones. Zhuhai, this is all down south. Zhuhai, Shantou, Shaman, Shenzhen. The fifth one was decayed in 1988, Hainan province, which is kind of called these days the Hawaii of China. It's a holiday resort, pretty tropical. Wasn't much going on there back in the day. Uh, but what happened was these zones started to effectively, everything in China became a negotiation. It wasn't just the zones that were carved out as free areas of enterprise, highly incentivized through tax, business efficiency, etc. The whole of China became one big zone for me. Everything was negotiable. And the real, my simple observation of Asia is the real intangible, some of the textbooks and the economists don't really say, the real intangible driver of growth in Asia has been intense competition. Not so much between countries, but between provinces, between cities, even district municipalities. It's unbelievable. Even in a place like, like, like Guangdong province, which has got about uh, 60 odd million people, this Guangdong down here, you'll find multiple, I'm talking maybe you know, 10 or 12 or more, different, uh, back in the day, different minimum wage uh, legislative arrangements, depending on the region. There's no such thing as a single national minimum wage in China. Because how can you expect something to be in Shanghai, but a significantly higher uh, standard and expectation of living? Would be the same for someone living in, I don't know, somewhere in the far, sort of in the sticks in the far west of China. Well, interesting observation. So why were, why were the, these SEZs located where they were? <coughs> well, very important. These three, uh, Zhuhai, Shantou, Shenzhen, are literally in the sort of almost POD, Pool River Delta area, and literally on the doorstep of Hong Kong, which is probably the greatest trip in real sort of success case ever. Literally, Hong Kong's a rock and nothing else. Hong Kong's global financial center, the deep pool of liquidity sitting in Hong Kong was attracted to these lines. Also cultural between Hong Kongese and people in Guangdong province. Strong cultural similarity, language similarity, i.e. trust. Trust and the people <coughs> commerce. So does uh, language. Similarly, so why shaman? Because the people in Xiamen speak almost identical dialect, Taiwanese, as those people living in Taiwan. Yeah, they all default to Mandarin, maybe, and understand each other. But ultimately, the family linkages and the, the closeness, almost, the connectivity of people, the cultural connectivity of people between Xiamen and Taiwan is incredibly close. Taiwanese people don't feel very culturally close to people in Beijing. Yeah, they're all Chinese, but there's a lot of people. Grain of the detail there, which people often miss. One other thing, just to mention here, is that uh, and, uh, these positioning of all of these SEZs were exactly the same places as where the Europeans had carved out, as I said, partial colonial geographic territories back in the 19th century. Exactly the same locations. And these were cities, areas open to commerce plugged into global connectivity or potentially and access to, to networks into marketplaces. 
I think that is very, very important. Not just to create a Chinese capital, I think Taiwan, I think Hong Kong, to a lesser extent, Singapore and the like, but also to, 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 to global capital as well. So this is a result, my last two slides. This is China 1962. This is the export basket. This is from CID, um, Ricardo Hausman's crowd at Harvard, does fantastic work. And the best measure of a country's competitiveness is not GDP. GDP is irrelevant. I'll tell you why now. GDP is irrelevant because Nigeria, Nigerian oil to GDP, oil to GDP, oil as a component of GDP in Nigeria, approximately 15%, even pre sort of uh, crisis in July 2014, the oil price went south to 15% GDP. It's not negative, but it's part of 95% of exports. The best measure of a country's competitiveness, it's a real time indicator, i.e., every month, is exports, i.e., it reveals your competitive advantage. You have something that someone else wants to buy, real time. Okay, so export baskets is the best indicator of competitors. So, China 62. This is just typical moribund, centrally planned, socialist, going nowhere status economy. The export basket was, I mean, pigs were quite a big deal. Um, finished cotton woven fabric, 6%. Rice, quite important back in the day. Animal origin materials, whatever that is, doesn't sound very nice. Soybeans. That was China 1962. If you look at China, even by the mid 70s, I was actually get the figures, it's not too different. Very similar. Nobody, nobody could have predicted that in three decades, slightly less, this economy would become the single largest, most manufacturing driven economy number one by an MBA manufacturing value add of any economy in the world. This is what they did. Export basket 2015. Electronics, switchboards, digital data processing, toys, we all know made in China, footwear, and everything else. Where is the, there's no resource risk here. The ability of the Chinese economy to adapt and shift to the vagaries and the changes of global demand is such that it's effectively de-risked itself in terms of its political profile. Massively, massively diversified. And my last comment literally is this. If the Chinese policymakers were inherent statists and not pragmatists, their question before reform, before Deng Xiaoping initiated reform, Post December 1970, their question to themselves would have been how do we beneficiate our resources? And what are our resources? Rats? Swine? Pigs? We've got some silk, we've got some soybeans, and we've got some silver in the ground. How do we beneficiate that? The question is wrong. Have a check, yeah. Thank you. That was great. Uh, the, I'm going to start off where you finished. Uh, our current Reserve Bank Governor, the Sergio Hanyago, was addressing a business meeting, the B Group, and one of the industrialists in the audience said to him, you know, what we need is more beneficiation, meaning you, the government, needs to subsidize and protect and so on. And his response was quite fascinating, and I guess you'd resonate with it. He said, beneficiation is rubbish. <laughs> like he, just, he said it's nonsense. Uh, resources are ubiquitous so all over the world. They cost the same price anywhere. The fact that a mineral happens to, or a resource happens to be produced where you are, has no relevance whatsoever as to whether you process or beneficiate it or not. So I think that's interesting. And I, I want to ask you, what you've really touched on here is what economists call the resource curse. What a place like uh, Nigeria seems to spend its life fighting about who gets the oil, which province, which city, which state, which company, should it be nationalized, should it be outsourced, privatized. Whereas in China, or resourceless places, Switzerland, Mauritius, Rwanda, whatever, people sit around saying, how do we get rich? Not how are we going to get our hand on the resource? 
And now the question though is why did it take Deng to do this? Why didn't other Chinese leaders <coughs> see this as what they have to do, is just become competitive and efficient? Or why don't in South Africa? You know, the, it seems to me we'd be so much better off if we had no natural resources at all. We'd get on with actually how do you become prosperous. A couple of things beyond. Firstly, on the Setch's point, he's entirely correct. I mean, look at it this way, is that um, the most successful economies at a macro level, the most successful economies um, in my lifetime, um, certainly the last half a century or more, and I argue even before that, have been the countries that have practically no resources. Mm. And they all reside in Asia, almost all of them. Even Latin America to an extent. Uh, South Korea has no resources. China has coal and gold, and that's about it. Uh, Singapore has nothing. Malaysia has palm oil from palm plantations, that's about it. Uh, South Korea, certainly so. So, uh, Japan. Um, countries like Japan, Korea have amongst the world's most competitive steel sectors, but no iron ore. Australia has lots of iron ore, but no steel sector. If you need a resource, put on a ship, it'll be here in three weeks' time. What's the problem here? Do you understand, to think that there's some, some to-be-gained competitive advantage from something in the ground, automatically you should be or could be doing something. It's such an obsolete statist, I don't know, um, it's so 19th century. So the second point is that, um, as you alluded to, is from what do the Chinese do? So, so this is what, well, it's 1949, China has had, even before that, has had the same institutions, the same bureaucracy, the same internal state processes, the same party, and yet that, that's one, that set of, of, of processed institutions impoverished the country even beyond what it was post-1949. That same set of institutions and party rescued the country through reform post-1978-79. How did it do that? It's, and this, I think you may be thinking perhaps the local context when I say this, is what is very important, I think, when it comes to, in China's case, the most best example I can give you is follows. What Deng Xiaoping did, and, and he had significant, and I mentioned earlier his trip to the south in 1992, southern China, to endorse the reform drive. Imagine a red bottle of wine. I choose the country's intention. A red bottle of wine. What Deng Xiaoping did, he got the red bottle of wine, he poured the wine out, and he <coughs> filled it with Coca-Cola. Just kept the labels. That's the China story. The branding remains the same in terms of the political branding, the party, the rhetoric toward a bygone ideology that reinforces a claim legitimacy of the party. And he replaced it with a, a, a very, um, should we say, uh, market-orientated, mechanicalist system that kept the labels to appease the left. Mm. That's what he did internally. <laughs> People who don't know China well enough still believe the labels. Mm. But that is, again, that's so 1970s, so 1980s. And you can imagine a society growing at 7, 8, 9, 10, 11% every year. The pace of change is so rapid that if you're not plugged into that country, that society, very regularly, you get left behind. The society leaves you behind. That's how fast it's changing. So I think the conclusion, to be honest, is to say that what is very, very important in China's case and the other countries' cases and our case as well is the structures are there, but it's the culture, for use of a better word, that infuses that entire system that either makes it productive or counterproductive. And that's the China story for me. Martin, here in South Africa, our big rhetoric at the moment is radical economic transformation. Uh, and what it is is tinkering around with existing policies, tweaking them here, changing them there, intensifying them somewhere else, which is it's not radical, it's not transformative, and it's not even much to do with economics. Uh, when you see what happens in China at their growth rates, if we'd grown at their rates since 1994, our economy would be three or four times bigger than it is. That's the effect of the compound interest you're talking about. 7% it would have been four times bigger now. Uh, sorry, at 10% it would have been about six or even eight times bigger. 
So eight times bigger economy, eight times richer country. At 7%, which as you say, we've only achieved once, but they achieved with ease, and especially in the zones, we would now be a very wealthy country. And that would be radical. Why do you think we keep talking about wanting transformation and transition and want it to be radical and want it to be transformative? And what gets proposed is actually, it's not even just more of the same since 94, it's more of the same from before 94. We seem to carry on as if somehow that's going to bring about a change. That's what we want. What's going, why are we so unable? Well, sorry, just before you respond. Our DTI, Department of Trade and Industries, created these IDZs, into which they poured lots of money and produced virtually nothing. They then sent a fact-finding mission to China to go and find out how they did it, and they went and showed them the SEZ, the Special Economic Zones, and I'm glad you mentioned all the other kinds of things that have the open cities and free ports and technical apps and so on. They came back, and we now have an SEZ policy here, and they apparently concluded that the trouble with us is we gave them the wrong name. So if they start calling them SEZs, they'll suddenly somehow become <laughs> like China. Literally, I mean, this seems to be how they think. They don't want them to be special in any way at all, under the same exchange control regulations, labor laws, tax laws, in no sense offshore, in no sense special, in no sense this radical free market which you mentioned. So say a little bit about South Africa and what we should be learning from China. Extremely complex issue, and I don't, I don't want to go on too long, so just yeah, please interrupt me and, and, and cut me off. I welcome it. Um, I put things in context here. I'll give you some provocative thoughts. Are we live yet? Are we live, Jim? Okay. I'll give some provocative thoughts, uh, if, if I may. Um, July 2008, Jacob Zuma, as president of the ANC, traveled to Beijing. Uh, he was his first visit to China as party president, uh, post Polycon. Met to the president of the time, Hu Jintao. And anyone goes to China, all of us go to China and we get very impressed by what we see. The skyscrapers, the urbanization story, the high speed trains, the incredible accumulation of wealth at the individual level, state level, and it's deeply impressive. Most people come away from China after a week or a few days with an interpretation that this is very statist. The state has created this. I would argue the state has enabled it, not created it. Um, but following that visit, one of the agreements was for every member of the National Executive Committee of the ANC to go to China uh, on a learning journey and hosted by the PRC government. I, I think most went over a, a couple of year period. And you know, when one goes to China on a, on a short period, you come back and I think that time, not the year 2008, September 2008, a few months later we had Lehman Brothers. The shock of Lehman was resulted in a, a short term. I'm a strong proponent of, of, of Schumpeter's creative destruction. Mm -hmm. It's okay. Uh, well, in short term, after after Jacob Zuma going to China in July 2008, we had the apparent short term crisis of capitalism post Lehman. Um, that I think the the ongoing influence of a not 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 propagated by the Chinese, but observed by some South Africans in China, that of a, a misinterpretation of the China model. Secondly, a crisis of capitalism. Thirdly, because of worldview, a inherent distrust of capital, um, which is personified by the rhetoric I often hear in this country, uh, which is very anti-Western. I'm not quite sure what Western is, because Japan is part of the West, Singapore is part of the West, but according to my map, that's Eastern Hemisphere. So is Australia, so is New Zealand. South Korea. South Korea. So the, this concept of the West, and I think this is important to, to, to put in as a, as a footnote here, it is not a geographic location, it's a set of institutions mm. and ideologies. Market fundamentalism, or free market uh, pursuit, uh, individual liberty, rights of the individual, Political liberalism, uh, Westminster style government, um, accountability, free media, freedom of religion, and the like. That's the West. 
So you can look at countries now. I think there's a uh, talk about the inherent sort of position of being of being anti-Western, whatever that is. Um, having a worldview that's quite different to a free market fundamentalist sort of view. All of this sort of combined. And also, when an economy is flailing, the natural inclination of the state is to be more interventionist. Not step aside. Not realizing that being more interventionist is just merely compounding the problem. It takes a strong visionary leader to actually step back from a problem and say, you know, I'm going to trust the process here. I'm going to trust the system, the people, to sort it out for themselves. And I think that talks to our, our, our mistakes, um, and at least compounding them. Um, I think, you know, the end for me is in Africa now, one could argue that Rob Mugabe in Zimbabwe he, a number of years ago, going back a decade or so, initiated what was called, and is often still called, a Go East policy, or Look East policy. And he was referring to Zimbabwe's linkages to China. If you understand the land reform that took place also under Deng Xiaoping, the privatization of land from these, not quite Soviet in terms of inefficiencies and starvation causing, but the collective land system in China also from the late 70s, early 80s was broken down by Deng Xiaoping's reforms. Mm-hmm. And land was, was, was effectively privatized at very small levels in sort of peri-urban urban area or became urban areas. And that increased the value significantly of that land in many people's pockets. Zimbabwe could be labeled a failed case of a misunderstood China policy. Not China growth policy. Mm. Um, I think South Africa, with inclination, when I hear the rhetoric of state and enterprises, radical and state, 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 it's a misapplied China model. Uh, the one country I can look at now, it's, it's a very historically, you know, history is not linear. Countries find themselves in different points in history, right now, in 2017. No one can tell me that life in Ethiopia is 2017 as my 2017. It's very different. But Ethiopia is a, it's definitely right now the China model that's being applied to China as it was circa mid 1980s. And it's working in terms of growth terms. It's working. Socially, it's unsettling as it was in China. Politically, um, the leadership has resolved, for better or for worse. Economically, it delivers results. So across our continent, you can look at cases now where, where there's the, 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 the perceived misapplied China model, and there's the understood, successfully applied China model in numerous countries in our own region right now. Um, you mentioned about the development ball and being in the southeast, and the northwest, which almost no one ever talks about, is surprising <coughs> that it's still. Cool. And in along the east and the south um, coasts, mainly or regions, there all this variety you had. I think somewhere you just said etc. and other similar types of things. Now that to me is unique in the world. I don't know of any other country that has this huge variety of different special zones. Ones for technical purposes, open city street ports, export processing zones. We know about the special economic zones because they're big. And I'd like to also to describe them, how big they are, what the area is, the population is on. Uh, but, but all of these other different things which the Chinese government seems to have almost bitten the drug. It got these successful special economic zones and then it got sort of addicted to special areas. And there are many of them and there are many different types. Can you just, just, I don't say break them all down, but just how important are they in this China story? Uh, and, you know, if you think of anywhere else, Ireland, that's Shannon, mm. Switzerland, the Fry Lager, and so on, they have one or two types of zone. China's the only place I know of that has just experimented with many different specialnesses, special types of zones. 
Uh, again, I don't believe the label's too much in China. No, it's, no. it's more of a marketing exercise and a branding exercise than no. in reality. Uh, I think, you know, firstly is that when a country, any country, I think ourselves right now as well, create a, a dedicated, dedicated, carved out zone, is that not indicative of the fact that the rest of the economy is not functioning? Yes, that's a part of my question. Ideally, you should, the whole place, you should not have to declare a zone mm. uh, to make one's system more efficient. So, Deng Xiaoping fully understood, and I think that, that um, again, uh, for a country at the time, which wasn't too far off a billion people, a sizable geography, significant ideological challenges, uh, the, the sort of, you know, the analogy being the oil tanker is not exactly a speedboat, it's an oil tanker. So, rather than sort of changing the direction of the oil tanker, which would take arguably decades or not at all, I think Nigeria now, carve out dedicated zones and give and, and, and give them the, the, the whatever incentives and local and delegate to local authorities to co- allow them to compete as much as possible and that's what happened so what we saw I mean effectively no one talks about SEZs in China today the mm-hmm. most recent creation and I mentioned them on the slides was the uh, Shanghai Free Trade Zone mm-hmm. so it's gone from S to F, free trade zone, in looking to to uh, revitalize once again, is because the, the system has become too bureaucratic, too much regulation, the cost of regulation is too high. So once again, China, it's almost SEZ 2.0, mm-hmm. carving out new zones again to try and you know, give new impetus to capital. Mm-hmm. Well, and effectively, you, you know, you it comes to a point in the economy that that you don't need to create those zones because the momentum effect is built up, and that's where China is today. Effectively, the timing of it was ideal. It was actually perfect. Uh, it wasn't by strategic intent, but if we go back to the 80s, at the same time, China or Japan was was on course. It was at the time by the mid 1980s. China, Japan was the second biggest economy in the world. We saw Japan's cost of production. Japan had clearly, by the early 80s, hit the bottom of the lowest turning point, economic term of sort of the the, um, gains in the cost of production outstripped gains in productivity. So that resulted in, and Japan being a relatively small geography, resulted in a very rapid um, hollowing out of Japanese industry, moving out of Japan to relocate its manufacturing facilities. We saw the same in Korea, sort of by the early 90s, we saw the same in Hong Kong around that time. Um, in the early 80s, Taiwan hollowing out of manufacturing. And you know, when I was growing up, all my toys were made in Taiwan and made in Hong Kong. Now, the only thing made in Hong Kong these days, uh, I half joke, is a lot of money <laughs> and great dumplings. <laughs> Dim sum's fantastic. <laughs> and nothing else. Mm. But so as, the, as Asia, uh, as surrounding economies were hollowing out, they were in search for a new manufacturing mm. Mm-hmm. new manufacturing platforms, bases. That was the first point. The second point was the there was a sense of inevitability that this country can no longer, this, this you know, China's not so much a country as often said, it, it, it's, it's a civilization pretending to be a country. And I mention that because don't look at China as a single entity. Mm-hmm. You've got to include the overseas Chinese territories, Singapore, Jakarta to an extent, Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur to an extent, further north, Hong Kong, Taiwan, in that there was inevitability, a belief inherently amongst all the 50 odd million Chinese living outside of the PRC at the time, that the country would have to start to liberalize. And when it did, that capital was ready and waiting. And as the country turned, the death of, the, of, uh, of, uh, of Mao Zedong in September 1976. It took two years following that political shock, to two and a bit years to get onto that reform track mm-hmm. as the politics was sorted out. Um, so, and then we saw Chinese capital, Chinese IP, greater Chinese IP flowing in, not to mention some forerunning sort of Western companies that started to arrive typically from maybe 83, 84, 85 onwards. Mm-hmm. One of the first pioneers was, was VW, went to China in 83. 
and be most successful and the most successful, not just automotive players, but foreign players in China, ever. So the timing of it was, was, uh, was ideal. And I think ultimately, socially, Chinese were becoming more aware and frustrated. You know, you, you, can't, you can't eat revolution forever. And um, that's, you know, I think the, the, the ideological exhaustion of the Chinese people come the mid 1970s. They've been through trauma, breaking forward, cultural evolution, on and on and on. And um, I think that, that internal pressure for change also. This would be two generations of this one. It's 1949, 1980, it's the generation and a half almost. And when Chinese were looking outward and saying, you know, why is it that fellow Chinese living in Taiwan, living across the fence in Hong Kong, living in Singapore, are significantly wealthier, wealthier than us Chinese in China. Clearly there's a problem here. Now, in China, for some reason, and I come from a Marxist background myself, and used to read a little red book. Uh, well, it used to repeatedly be replaced when they changed their mind about what the facts were. Uh, but one of the constant gripes in the Little Red Book was about the diversity in China. They never managed to actually bring about uniformity. There were different land policies in different provinces and so on. And it seems to me that what China's great strength is, one of its strengths, is that everyone accepts we spoke about one country, two policies. But in fact, it was one country, multiple, many policies, and a huge diversity. In fact, the Economic Freedom Index for the different provinces of China puts the least free province as on the same level as the least free economy in the world, and the most free province, I know, as the as free as, as Hong Kong, for example, the freest country, or considered a country. So in South Africa, we have this mindset of uniformity. There's one policy, one education policy, one police policy, one everything, one health policy, and the whole country gets it. You know, one size fits all. So that seems to me to a big, uh, be a big handicap for us, for zones, and one of the reasons why just the whole of South Africa should be a zone, because South Africans just can't imagine a country with internal diversity. It always fascinates me. When we had the federal the, the PFP, the Federal Party, and they used to debate urban transport policy in Parliament. And I always said, but if it's urban, why are you debating it in Parliament? You know, what, is the, what does the F in PFP stand for? So uh, one of my questions is, what do we do in South Africa if we can't make the entire country a rural part of the country? Since 220, 221 BC, Qing Dynasty. Mm -hmm. The Chinese, greater Chinese, because the Chinese borders in the last few thousand years has effectively done that. Um, the Chinese created an effective state um, roughly one and a half thousand years before the West Europeans created an effective state. The challenge in China, amongst other Northeast Asian countries, think Korea, I think Japan, who have a very similar political background history, is not to create effective states, but to restrain the state. The challenge in our part of the world is to create an effective state. Their challenge is, 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 is the flip side, is to restrain the state. So what does this mean related to your question? Is China is a large land mass. A country like, even a small country like South Korea has, and Japan to an extent, more South Korea, has internal, highly competitive regionality between the provinces. In China, that highly competitive intra-country com competitiveness is on steroids. Mm. Mm. And always has been. Yes. So, Mao well, complained about it. He tried to prevent it, but couldn't. But isn't that what socialism and communism were all about? Mm. Communist states was about centralization. Mm. And it was contrary to China's history. Mm. So we saw the, 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 the perpetuation and the reinforcement of poverty in China 
um, during the 1950s, 60s, 70s, at a time when the politics was becoming more and more centralized. What Deng Xiaoping did was to not delegate, but redelegate once again that and reduce the centrality of the state post early and mid 1980s in China. And that allowed it unleashed the forces of comp of, 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 of competitiveness in a broader Chinese society that has <coughs> always been competitive. Mm. Very much so. Mm. And you look for all the why does China have some different mm. dynasties with effectively different political classes, different elites competing for power in the country. It's always been like that. So um, you know, the dynamic change later with sort of Taiwan, which was a which was a Chinese economy competing. Korea, sort of Japan, and there's often no greater um, motivation than having a point to prove. Um, Are we then condemned to the centralized, uniform, smothering state, or is there any chance we can escape it the way the Chinese? Do? I don't know. I think I think this is something which we, we which at a deeper thought level we haven't thought about. Yeah, mm -hmm. you're, you're ahead of the curve here, mm -hmm. but. We haven't thought about that, never mind debated it, mm. vice versa. Mm. I think for me, and, and we talk about, you mentioned the IDZ slash SEZs here, mm. is a great initial idea, mm. but it, it talks to, and I'll talk about the mistakes if I may. Yes, um, I'll go to my next question. So, I drove through Koka a few years ago, and it's fantastic. The hardware is amazing, it's right by the sea, big port. Looks great. Great infrastructure. The hardware is there, so where's everybody? Mm. The same in the other IDs, Richards Bay, East London, and you can maybe expand the IDZ to include one or two companies like Mercedes <laughs> Benz and claim it. That's okay. <laughs> but really, we haven't seen the, uh, the, the, the attractiveness, or uh, there's, there's no real, you know, we, we have not combined the hardware, which is amazing with the software that's, that's essential. And this goes back, I think Treasury was having this discussion back in maybe 10 years ago, and there was a McKinsey report, which I think I found was very wrong, saying that, and it quoted, and you can Google search this, that, um, that incentives are not sustainable, therefore we build the infrastructure, and the market itself will, will attract the, uh, the investors based on the, those, the market's own merits. I strongly disagree with that. Uh, and I'm, once again, South Africa is at a, uh, if you read a guy called uh, Harm de, Harm de Bale, I think his name is, uh, it was called the, the um, he wrote a book on the, the, roughly speaking, it was the comparative advantage of geography. Mm -hmm. The power of place, mm -hmm. is what it's called. South Africa has a geographic comparative disadvantage to the global economy. We're not a hub or destination. Dubai could not have been created here as a throughput hub. It couldn't be too far away. Considering our geography, considering you know the Suez Canal, unfortunately, I just wish that land at Suez had been much wider so the canal would never have been built. Mm. But we have that geographic comparative disadvantage. We have to incentivize, and relatively speaking, Again, compounded by poor region integration. We haven't got the market size to attract. We're geographically comparatively disadvantaged. We have to provide a software I incentive to get capital here. It's capital from our own country to mobilize, or capital from wherever it may be to come. The second point is, uh, and one thing I alluded to earlier, but it's, 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 I think it's a very crucial point to make, is that what the, when I was in China in the 80s, and, I'm sorry, the 90s, Every Chinese state, moribund state enterprise was looking to privatize and sell off assets to some naive foreigners. You should read a book by Tim Clissold, Mr. China, his first one. Brilliant book. Tells exactly that story. And so you'd go to see some really bad, poorly managed assets in some sort of outside the urban center. Everyone working at this factory or company would live there. They'd have a school, the hospital, and everything else they have on site. The services were appalling, and the place was just a mess. 
but they want to sell you at equity uh, for a massive implied inflated cost. And all they were interested in, the Chinese, was, was a check. They wanted money. That's all they wanted. All they wanted, early 90s. Nothing else. Where's your FDR? Where's your investment? Bring us the money. That was it. By the late 90s, things have changed quite a bit. And yes, we want a check, but we want technology, i.e. IP as well. You've got to put your IP off. By the early 2000s, maybe 2005, 2010, by 2010 latest, the Chinese were not interested in the money at all. At all. You want, and many South African companies, Sassol, case in point, <coughs> Sassol was meeting $8.5 billion investment into China. So the Chinese are like, well, we don't really care. It's not about the check size, it's about the IP. And what you see in China then, the last 10 years effectively in China, is there's no interest in money. There's absolute interest in IP, intellectual property, and that's it. So what does it mean for our IDZs slash SEZs? There's no point in having an SEZ, IDZ, if your only focus is, let's get money and jobs. You won't talk about, the real question is, how do we attract intellectual property into the special economic zone? Because you can't say to this, we want your money, but we don't want you. You can't say that. Mm. And you want to come out there for how long? And you want your kids to come too? Mm. And you want your family to visit you? No, 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 we can't do that. Mm. As I said earlier, you know, you tell me about a, you, you talk to me about a skill shortage, mm. I'll show you a bad immigration policy. Mm. So we've got to get over ourselves, I think, as South Africans. Lose the zero sum mentality, i.e., there's only a set number of jobs. And if one goes to someone who's not born within the, the, the sort of, dare I say, artificial borders drawn up sometime sort of 18th, 19th century, if you weren't born in those confines, somehow you don't really qualify. We don't really trust you. That, I'm afraid, is, 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 is really, really damaging to, to, to prospects of an economy. So with the IDZs we have, or SEZs, don't just make them attractive to capital. Make them attractive to people. Because innovation, technology, follows people. It doesn't follow money. Can we just, uh, for those who are not familiar with it, discuss the geography a little? Because uh, the IDZs in South Africa, if you've never been to them, let me describe them. You go to the one in East London, for example, and uh, or Cooker or Richard Bay. They're beautiful roads, beautiful infrastructure, lots of government, taxpayer, public funds spent on assuming that one day they will be uh, producing wealth. Uh, roads and electricity and telephones and fiber optic cables and, and so on and so forth. Uh, okay. And then they go inside and they stare. You drive up and down these roads with vacant plots and street lights and, uh, and, and power lines and so on. Uh, and you talk about bringing in people. There's no residential area. It's just, a, it's just like an industrial uh, suburb, <coughs> whereas the Chinese versions are entire communities with shopping centers and houses and apartment blocks and where people move in. And a friend of mine, and they're much bigger, uh, maybe you can just give us an idea of size. I can tell you our IDZs are, you know, smaller than Branson, and theirs are, their biggest ones are bigger than Kaoteng. And uh, so... What happens here, it seems to me, is there's no conception of what you're talking about, the movement of intellectual capital, the movement of IP. And um, in China, a friend of mine has had factories in, in SEZs, Special Economic Zones, and he says he never gets asked anything. He just brings in whatever skills he wants, he takes in whatever capital he wants. Uh, he doesn't have to apply for a visa, he just flies in as he feels like it. He, if he needs a particular skill or management or lawyer to represent him in a court case, they, he just brings in whoever wishes and no, there are no questions ever asked. Now again, we in South Africa just cannot imagine that world. It's so completely alien to our mindset. I don't know how we get there. We talk radical economic empowerment, but they don't mean anything radical at all. They, they're actually far too conservative. Now. Um, just describe for us two things. One is a bit of the geography of these zones, and I know they vary a lot from big to small. 
compared to our IDZs. And then secondly, the, this issue of the freedom, the, the whole mindset is capital, interest, profit, technology, IP, people. You know, if, if you've got skills, we want them, please bring them. <laughs> Whereas our, what we do is we put up the barricades. We get into the castle and pull up the drawbridge behind us. Uh, we're not in the castle, actually. We get into the slum and pull up the drawbridge behind us. And yeah. Uh, two things then in response to you. Firstly, the size. The biggest SEZ traditionally was Hainan Island, which Hainan, was the entire yeah. province. That was yeah. a province of China. Yeah. Hainan uh, is, uh, you think, uh, size-wise, it must be... I mean, sure, you probably know Hainan in terms of size, but I guess it's the size. Size of the Free State, maybe? Probably, probably. Yeah. Maybe if you bigger, can imagine the entire Free State. Bigger. Probably bigger. Well, bigger, yeah. Yeah. That's what we're talking about. So, yeah, they go and they they buy a plot, yeah. put in some roads, and they call it an SEZ. The, yeah. the whole of Hainan, but again, this yeah. was a very, this a very poor, a poor mm. province of China. Mm. Again, very mm. tropical island. Mm. Well, mm. Nothing was going on there. Mm. So just declare the entire island, uh, especially economic. Mm. I think mm. that's mm. what they did. Mm. Um, obviously, as like Shenzhen was, was relatively small, but expanded. Mm. Uh, you can't start off with 300,000 people mm. and end with 15 million expecting the same size. Mm. So as it expanded, so the regulations and the sort of you know, the Chinese, are, and I mentioned earlier about getting the foot off the throat of the private sector, the Chinese government has always been at, 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 at central government and local level. <coughs> and of course this comes with, with the inevitability, and, and Deng Xiaoping himself said once, said that, once said that, you know, as you open the doors, flies will fly, will come in. And he talks about corruption. Mm. And of course this, is, this has been an inevitable issue, and, uh, and the cancer of corruption certainly has, 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 has impacted China's growth and efficiencies of it as well. But as the, you know, China's, the state, should I say, at whatever level, has always been allowing Chinese to, businesses, people, to see what they can get away with. Mm -hmm. And the board, that they push, push, push as much as they can, and the Chinese government reigns it in again, and makes it legal. Mm -hmm. So everyone seems to go a little bit beyond, and the government reigns it in. Go a little beyond, government reigns it in. Same at a local level, the SEZ. So that was always the case. Okay, the tax rate is X amount, 15%, whatever it may be, but you know, I'll give it to you for 10. Mm -hmm. Or there's no real set rule. And that's often the case in China today, in certain parts, mm -hmm. even in Southeast Asian countries. Tax rates, negotiable. Mm -hmm. What are you doing? Are you setting up a regional headquarters in our, in our, in our, in our region? Uh, how many people are you employing? What's your investment rate? You know, how many, what IP are you contributing? Uh, you know, we'll, we'll discuss the tax rate. That's not really our issue right now. It's not about liquidity. It's not about getting money. Mm. It's about getting IP and getting broader sort of scalable um, sort of impact in a society. I think the second point is uh, what you referred to is, is, is creating a, um, an ecosystem, uh, the correct ecosystem. Everyone's competitiveness, whether you're an individual, whether you're a company, your ability to compete is dependent upon the in ecosystem that you find yourself in, mm. uh, which Ricardo Hausman talks about letters, mm. the alphabet. You know, if you're living in South Sudan, or Niger, or, or I guess Cambodia, perhaps, you haven't got many letters to compete. You're stuck with vowels, and you can't create complex letters. Mm. If you're living in New York, or Johannesburg, to a large extent, or Cape Town, or uh, London, uh, Paris, Frankfurt, you, Singapore, you have lots of letters around you. Letters could be a, a business school, a university, a competitor, it could be cell phone connectivity, it could be you know, Wi-Fi, whatever. Um, it could be something so simple as that. Surround yourself with letters. So the challenge is when you're having a uh, IDZ or an, a, an EPZ or an SEZ, whatever you want to call it, is how do you create that ecosystem? Where does the state, how does the state enable and incentivize? How does private capital step, step in and take an opportunity? The real challenge lies in the kickstarting, is getting the engine started. Mm. That's the real challenge. And that's where uh, I tend to uh, become, which is very ideologically uh, offensive for myself, is to say, okay, let's be a bit statist on this. The state needs to do something to start the engine. Just do something. Mm. Create the infrastructure, create those incentives, do something then, and then step aside. Mm. So how do you start the engine and create that momentum? When the momentum is there, and it's constant policy consistency, efficiency by the state, ecosystem created, then you'll see magic happen. And I talked about an effective state earlier, and 
you know, it's, we call it in South Africa capacity building, whatever you want to call it, but uh, how do you create an effective state? Rwanda's done it uh, in a very short period of time, really be speaking, um, in Kigali. A state that enables capital, a state that is very responsive to, to, to capital and business, and creates a very, very enabling environment. It comes back to your issue of having any resources beyond agriculture. So, how do you create state efficiency? How do you, how do you educate your people? How do you generate IP either locally or track from somewhere else? Mm -hmm. And how do you create that, that? How do you start that engine? That's I think. Martin, I'm uh, enjoying the fireside chat, but we have people in the audience, some of whom are themselves very knowledgeable, and I think we should invite anyone to make a comment or ask a question. Yeah. Um, my name is David Ansara. Um, uh, one of the other Dong Xiaoping quotes that I really love is, it doesn't matter, matter whether a cat is black or white, as long as it catches mice. I think that that's a philosophy that we really lack in South Africa, that kind of ideological flexibility about you know, trying to follow a more pragmatic path. But I, I think one of the, 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 the questions that I have is, you know, beyond some of those uh, kind of policy interventions, is China's success actually replicable in other countries? I mean, I see what you're saying about the Lewis curve, and you have manufacturing now exiting to places like Vietnam and even Ethiopia, which you mentioned. But my view is that China has so fundamentally disrupted global supply chains uh, since its ascension to the WTO in 2001 that I don't actually think that 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 is going to be very difficult to steal, or that it's going to be easy to steal uh, China's lunch there, right? I mean, how does a small open economy like South Africa even begin to, to challenge the supremacy of China in terms of manufacturing, for example? We have a nascent manufacturing industry here that's, that's kind of being hollowed out. So, so where, where do you start to kind of compete with China? Okay, tough one. Um, so let's look through the manufacturing lens, uh, as, as you mentioned. So our current manufacturing to GDP in South Africa, I'm guessing is somewhere between 12 to 13 percent of GDP. The global average is 18.18. The two countries that shoot the lights up, developing countries, are i.e. 30 percent plus, are China and Thailand. Then you have countries which are developed, but also have 25, nudging 30 percent in some cases, manufacturing to GDP. These would be countries like Germany, Austria, Switzerland, Japan, Singapore. Um, the US is an 18, no, sorry, the US is the same as us, 12, 12 and a half, 13. South Africa, two, uh, a generation ago, 20 odd years ago and change, we were approximately 23, 24%, maybe out but not by much, of manufactured GDP. We have hollowed out and deindustrialized for two main headline reasons. One, self-inflicted goals, uh, self-inflicted self wounds, sorry, and we all know we all have our interpretation of that. And secondly is our inability to compete with the China price or more accurately the Asia price on manufacturing. So are we able to, this is sort of the, the ultimate question I think we're posing is, can a country industrialize in the face of intense competition coming out of China? Yes, is a short answer. Because here's Thailand, literally on China's border, and it's still 30 to GDP manufacturing. Back in the late 90s, there was a discussion in ASEAN. I was in Singapore at the time. And Go Chok Tong, the former Prime Minister of Singapore, gave his national day address in Singapore, and his talk was largely fo partly focused on how do we as Singapore, because Singapore is like Korea, so they're always paranoid. The world's always coming to an end. If we don't compete, we're going to die. It's the best we compete and figure it out. That's the mentality. There is zero complacency in Seoul and zero complacency ever in Singapore. So their whole crisis of existence in the late 90s in Southeast Asia, as verbalized by Goh Chok Tong, super smart guy, was do we have a future? Can we exist in the face of this real and increasingly pending onslaught of Chinese competitiveness? So with hindsight, 2017, rewind 10, 20 years, they have succeeded dramatically, as of most Southeast Asian countries. 
So in China's case, has China been a force for deindustrialization or development in Asia? Arguably, it's both. Look at Japan, South Korea, different examples. Okay. In our case, in the African context, it's quite different. We're not too distant to Latin America, which is also to an extent deindustrialized. Think Brazil, again for self-inflicted wounds to an extent. So when I see the case of Southeast Asia, I don't think I'm being too hard on myself saying that, you know, uh, that's just how it is. We can't compete. I think we can. But we've got to be seriously smart and seriously paranoid <laughs> to be able to do so. And at the moment, I don't think we're either. Anyone else? I used to stay here at the Market Foundation. And I'm sure you're familiar with the story of John Carpethwaite in Hong Kong. And he had a, a, a policy, a very important policy. It was active non-intervention. So in other words, do nothing. Leave the people alone. Introduced a flat tax of 16%. The people after the war 1940, in the year 1945, um, people started, they'd been, the Japanese had been in control of Hong Kong, they shunted all the people, most of the people out, they came pouring back, there was huge unemployment, um, a lot of poverty, and Carpathwaite said, just leave them alone, and gradually they started off, you'll remember the small plastic toys they made and all that kind of thing. Gradually, when uh, Leon and I were there in 1978, and what they were complaining about, shortage of labor. After going through this terrible time, that's what we need here, yeah, positive non-intervention. No, Hong Kong is my, one of my favorite cities in the world. I totally agree. But it's this question, Hong Kong, you've got this, you know, again, it's about, can I be like more, slightly more granular on the Chinese? Um, you know, people in Shanghai, people in um, certain locations, sort of along the southeast seaboard of China, in Fujian, Guangdong province, people in Hong Kong, particularly, have very different cultures, big word, big catch-all word, than other Chinese in other parts of the country. They're incredibly entrepreneurial, um, incredibly, they don't really look into the country, they always look out of the country. They look towards the sea, they don't look inland. They're natural inherent traders. It's just this, this institutional sort of gen, in cross-generational sort of ability or trading ethos that they have built up over literally centuries, if not millennia. And that certainly is the, uh, has, has, has underpinned what the Hong Kongese have achieved um, in their territory. Um, yeah, since, you know, it, it's a, uh, you know, if, you, if you're marrying an a, a English legal system, a apolitical civil service, um, with a Hong Kongese, Cantonese industriousness and trading ethic, it's a powerful combination. Of course, they were brokering trade uh, for for the Chinese. So much of the stuff came came through Hong Kong. Exactly, it was a conduit. They were the middlemen. Oh, yeah. The Hong Kong people were doing doing the deals. And the Hong Kong discussion post sort of 1978 or mid 80s was how are we going to survive? because now China's opening up. What's our role? We're no longer the middleman. What do we do now? There must be a, a crisis of, there must be this, this, this constant uh, angst amongst the leadership, all the time thinking, you know, if we don't compete, we won't survive. And that has underpinned the success cases of all these countries I'm talking about, or and territories. A, an important factor is that it's only about five years ago that Hong Kong introduced a minimum wage. Prior to that, there was no minimum wage and very little as far as controlling 
Yeah. Yes, the thing is, you know, Leon, you mentioned now is use the word radical. And this is, and Hong Kong's faced similar challenges. And Hong Kong really is, the, the inequality in Hong Kong is quite dramatic, but we're talking about inequalities relative here. Inequality between the billionaires who hang out in sort of the peak and, and, uh, and the central uh, versus sort of the people making maybe 50,000 bucks a month living in the new territories. Okay. So inequality is not like as stark as, it's not people aren't sort of homeless and starving uh, or begging for traffic lights. There's a different level here. Okay. But where I'm going with this as follows is the, the notion of inclusive growth which is inequality clearly is a burning issue of our time, not so. Um, social media has made it far more obvious and far more um, transparent and communicable. communicable. So the, the situation we face now is uh, many countries, including Hong Kong and South Africa, particularly South Africa, uh, South Africa probably more than anybody, is the notion of inclusive growth uses your argument would be the state to step aside and inclusive growth will naturally happen. The argument of certain policy makers now in our current government would say exact opposite. The state must intervene and get involved. This becomes very emotive because of legacy issues in this country. It becomes very ideological, perhaps. I think the, the neutral comment I would make is that there is a an inclination probably probably certainly potentially for the imperative of inclusive growth the imperative for inclusive growth the requirement the social requirement for inclusive growth to result in bad policy and we really are at a interesting such a benign word, interesting. <coughs> We're at a very interesting point in time to see how the state will react. States, plural, will react. Do they get to, to solve this burning issue of inequality? If it is solvable by the state, do states become more interventionist and seek to remedy situations through increased tax and transfers? Or does the state become less interventionist, hopefully more enabling, and saying, well, Maybe it's unequal because of us. I don't hear any state saying that. No one says that. I don't know. So let's see how this plays out. But uh, I think it's going to be a very, it's a very interesting policy conversation. Uh, from an observation perspective, all of us in the room are observers, if not participants. Um, and in, in, for better or for worse, we'll certainly be impacted by this in the very near future if we aren't already. Thanks, uh, yeah. Hi, uh, Rod Hunter. Do, do you foresee that Trump's inward-looking policies will actually lead to further Chinese opportunity and growth? <coughs> in China, you mean? <coughs> Everywhere? In China or beyond China? Okay, just Especially to, beyond. Okay, I, I'm certainly not a Donald Trump supporter. I never met one, so I don't know where they are. But apparently they voted, a lot of them. Um, the... Donald Trump presidency has been a, a significant geoeconomic, geopolitical uh, boon to uh, Beijing. The cancellation of TPP by, um, which obviously was a Barack Obama initiative, um, it'll, re, it'll morph itself, TPP will morph into a Japan-US preferential free trade agreement, effectively. But the cancellation of TPP was of significant geoeconomic importance and geopolitical importance to the Chinese, very much so. Um, the um, ignorance of Donald Trump vis-a-vis -vis Asia, generally, and the um, lack of any coherence in foreign policy by the likes of, under the Trump administration currently, or as we say, a, a confused foreign policy. There's Donald Trump's views and there's the institution's views. And those two are probably like this in DC right now. Uh, the US is fortunate to have incredible institutions of incredibly smart people. And therefore, we'll, we'll, you know, Donald Trump will come and go, but institutions in America, when it stands for, will remain, I think. But I think in, in China's case now, China's strategy, and you'll see it uh, over the years, 
China fully understands that what could derail growth in China? What could what could destroy the futures of pro approaching a billion and a half people? A, fi a financial fiscal shock, i.e. a crisis. We don't want a 2008 September moment to happen with a domino effect there afterwards, if I'm from the Chinese perspective. So let's sort of, let's not do a Southeast Asia 1996-97 sort of style thing. That's the first thing. The second thing, we don't want to have some sort of major political internal disruption. So the Chinese Commerce Party, well, we're under control. Everything's fine. We'll manage the succession properly. We won't make the serious mistakes we as a party made in the 60s and 70s. We understand succession is the most important thing politically, and we put in informal rules that every 10 years we get a new president and a new prime minister. That's sort of a rule, okay, the unspoken, un unwritten rules in China. Great. So political stability. The third rule related to the US is let's not have a conflict in there. Wars, international sort of forays, wars on our borders, that ain't good. That's going to destabilize the entire system. It's going to scare capital. It's going to really rock the boat, if you will. So let's not do that. Whether it's North Korea, whether it's Taiwan, we'll go cold on that. Um, whether it's Japan, mm, we'll have a few protests, but nothing serious. Or whether it's a, uh, if we have to tolerate US spy planes flying up and down our coast every day, mm, we'll let it go. We're not going to cause a conflict. That's sort of the Chinese, very simplistic geopolitical sort of view of you know, stability will, um, will underpin long-term development and growth. Let's not rock the boat on any boat, socially, politically, and militarily, whatever it may be. Um, I think we can take one more and then we'll give it a close. So if there's another one, Fabi, which uh, I'll use the prerogative to make a proposition and ask Martin to respond. It's interesting to me that when we proposed this session with you now, that there was a concern that no one would be interested. And the turnout is not as big as we get. And particularly, there's a lack of media interest, which I find astonishing. Since uh, yeah, you have a discussion about the policies that have generated the most extraordinary story in economics, almost in world history, but certainly True. in recent history. True. Here you have a country that is stagnating with the higher definition, nearly 40%, 4 out of 10 unemployed. Here you have a country that is talking about radical economic transformation in which there's no growth. In other words, just rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. And there's so few people that are interested. Now, I just find that astonishing. I would have thought, especially since our government has announced it wants special economic zones, it wants SEZs, doesn't seem to understand them, but you know, conceptually wants them, and wants to have inclusive growth. And when you have a discussion about the greatest modern success story at achieving those goals, radical transformation, inclusive growth, there's apparently a lack of media interest, for example. So how do you get journalists? How do you get South Africans? How do you get our politicians? How do you get our portfolio committees? I think if you went to the DTI portfolio committee and said, your department is creating special economic zones, they probably won't know what you're talking about. Um, so, that is quite distressing. I don't know, as a closing comment, whether you can uh, say, how do we get your story, your message, your expertise to be considered the most important thing for South Africans to know and learn about? And uh, they don't. And so, you know, if we could have you, I don't know, addressing Parliament, the caucuses of the different political parties, the portfolio committees, uh, it's, there is no hope for this country, in my view, if this discussion is not considered the most important and interesting one to have. Yeah, Leon, you know, it's, um, I think because it's a consequence, as Africans, we think we're special. No. Don't shoot the messenger. We're not. Now, whether it's a consequence of our domestic politics, maybe it's our distant geography, our self-obsession. I think South Africans are increasingly inward-looking than outward. 
we can't see the forest for the trees. And and I compare it to Asia. The thirst the thirst for knowledge amongst young Asian people from abroad is incredible. They want to go on holiday everywhere. They want to try different foods. They want to try different drinks. They want to buy something from there. They want to experience. They want to go out and work. They want to st study it at universities across the world. There's this incredible um, you know, innate universe. sort of competitiveness that they have. Mm. I didn't see the same sort of um, willingness to, 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 to learn what's going on in the greater context. Often, I see it occasionally in South Africa, we're kind of too introspective as a country, as, as companies even, as individuals. That's the first point. I think the second one is, uh, to conclude, is, and, you know, I, I, looked, I read in the news that the DTI had just sent 34 um, officials to China. They came back last week. They've been in China for two weeks or something on training courses for SEZ management. And I thought that was a great thing. Very good. I hope they came back with what I come back with, came back with from China in terms of don't believe the labels. Understand the substance. And, um, you know, we, 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 it's almost sort of paradoxical that the one part of China we are, we are copying but it's so obsolete, it's like 1950s, 60s, is this notion of developmental state. The state will drive growth through state and enterprises. Now you know where that's taking us in a very, very, to a very, very dark place, very quickly. Um, at the same time, we're talking the other China model, which is more recent, SEZs. And and I'm afraid, you know, for me, the best success stories, and I measure success by creating broad-based, diffused wealth in better middle-class societies in countries. The best examples in recent years, decades, has come, have come out of Asia. Countries that have really gone through significant internal traumas um, have overcome that have created effective states based on aspirational or, um, or aspirational nations, at the very least, or real nations, i.e. social unity, and have got the economics right, the policies right, and above all implementation right. If we don't look to Asia, um, I'm afraid, where else can we look? The solutions to a problem Know, to conclude is and, and this is a veiled uh, criticism of certain parties perhaps is you know the solution to a problem often lies outside of a box if your box is an ideology and the solution is outside your ideology you are never going to find a solution so literally is lose the ideological thinking lose the rhetoric that we have which reinforces the ideology often, uh, reinforces we, you know, the, the political speak, the political double speak we have inside. And let's look for practical, um, very achievable, very achievable, I think, uh, I believe, um, solutions that lie outside our current ambit of thinking, which certainly needs to expand. Thank you. I think. Uh, mm -hmm. We're enlightened and informed and we just have to persuade everyone else to listen to you. Thank you so much, Martin. <laughs>